delighted to have you here. This is going to be a rare opportunity for all of us um, to uh, revisit history in a very unique way. I, when, when I first heard about Hands Off, Hand Off, the, uh, and Steve was you know, assembling the authors, and the concept was, I thought, unique and really important to go back and find the, uh, you know, the original transition memos and then ask people who authored them to now offer commentary about it. You know, I thought it was a brilliant thing. It's, it's, it, uh, it's, it's probably one of the most novel and, and, and helpful contributions for all of us, you know, to be able to be sitting in that room with them as they were wrestling with things, charting a future they couldn't see. It was really fascinating. It's a wonderful book, and of course, um, I think having Steve Hadley here, who was the, the, the spark of imagination that made all of this possible, it's a real privilege for us today. David Sanger, who uh, is also someone that doesn't need an introduction, but David is, is of course, with the New York Times and you know, the, probably the premier uh, international security affairs uh, columnist in the, in the world, and uh, we're delighted that he's here. He's going to lead a fascinating conversation and a dialogue. Let me turn it to you, David. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, and um, thank you all who are here and those who are uh, joining us, and thanks to Steve for um, this really remarkable book. Um, it's, it's not a quick read, Steve. Uh, I should have brought my copy up here. It's ab about this big, uh, right? Um, it's a great doorstop. You, you, could, you, could, you could probably crush small animals with it. It's so heavy. But, um, but it's, got, it's full of fascinating stuff. And what's interesting about it is that um, while it is history, it is certainly not um, ancient history now. Uh, and... Um, Usually you wouldn't read something like this until 25, 30 years after, you know, until declassification begins to, begins to happen. And um, then it usually takes another five years or so for people to actually get around to declassifying. Um, so see, the first question I have for you about this before we delve into the substance is, how did you get away with getting this stuff declassified so fast? Uh, I'll try to, to answer that question. I, first, I want to thank CSIS for having this event this morning, Victor Cha and others for, for arranging it. I want to thank John Hamry. I get a lot of people come to me and ask for advice, and I give them the best advice I can, and I say, but the person you really want to talk to is John Hamry because he's the smartest man in Washington and the wisest man in Washington, and I really believe that. So thanks to him and thanks to CSIS. Um, I think one of, there are a couple reasons why this went as well as it did. One is uh, we didn't just go to people and say, will you declassify these documents, but we described what we were going to do with them and the project as a whole, what the book was going to be. And I think that helped. It helped get the president, former President Bush on board with the project, and it helped that he wrote the letter to the National Archives asking that the transition memos and their attachments be declassified. Uh, but I think the, the National Archives people liked the concept, what we were going to do with the memos, and they also liked the idea of trying to declassify them and get them out in public, because the National Archives is an advocate for getting things declassified, getting them out in the public. They moved relatively quickly, given the fact that, A, it's a small staff, B, we were in COVID, so they weren't able to go into the office, which is required to review these documents because they're all classified. And thirdly, they were under a lot of uh, re requirements for documents associated with the January 6th Commission, for example. So they had a lot going on under difficult conditions. And it's amazing that in a spirit period of two years, two and a half years, 39 of the 40 transition memos have been declassified and probably two-thirds to three-quarters of the attachments to those memos, which are quite voluminous, have been declassified as well. So, so you have to tell us, what was, the, what was the 40th one? 40th one is on Turkey and the PKK. There was a lot going on on that issue. <laughs> and uh, I think that one will never see the light of day. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one, and you always, always wonder what's, one. There's always one. Um, well, um, I particularly enjoyed these because um, 
I would have to say as a reporter, um, uh, Steve uh, and before him Condi Rice were probably the most open and willing to engage with the press about why they were making the decisions they were making. Even if there was a rare moment or two, I can only <laughs> count just a few, where Steve might not have been so thrilled with my coverage. I, I can think of a few, and we could do a completely separate session on that. Um, but two things struck me, because particularly because I'm, I'm working away on, on some things on China and Russia these days for a book. And that is how dramatically different just the tone of the relationship with both China and Russia were at the time yeah. uh, that you left it. So to the point that you could say, I left you a perfectly good relationship. What did you guys <laughs> do? Um, but uh, let's start in with that. So let me start with Russia. Um, I have a strong memory of uh, traveling with you to Russia uh, one time. I, we, had a wonderful dinner with the ambassador at the time, Bill Burns. Yes, we did. Seems to be busy uh, away on Russia issues uh, to this day. Um, and I remember the president going to Russia relatively soon after 9-11. I think it was a 2002 visit, floating down the Neva River with, uh, with uh, Putin. Uh, big dinner. They would meet students at... Um, uh, the University of St. Petersburg. Later on, Putin came to uh, Crawford. They met students, high school students outside Crawford. Um, they were joking with each other. It seemed like a radically different Putin. But as you read through these notes, it's clear that by the second term, all of you, and the president included, were beginning to have second thoughts about whether the Putin they thought they had in the first term was the same Putin they had in the second term. Tell us about that. So um, Putin was new to the job when President Bush came into office. He'd been president, I think, since 1999, about a year. Um, and was, when they first met him, this famous, I looked into his eyes and saw his soul. When they first met, met uh, Putin was a very nervous guy. So, and this was also at a time when Russia was weak. And at one point, I remember Putin gave a speech and basically told the Russian people their economy on a good day was going to be the size of Italy's. These are tough words for a president of Russia. To have he had to that right. People. He had it, that right. They were the size of Italy until they did the invasion. Now they're smaller. Now they're smaller. Yeah. But, um, you know, if you read Russian history, and I'm no historian, but there's a wonderful book, The Icon and the Axe, which tells the story of Russian history from the 13th, 14th century forward. And you see that for 400 years, Russia has been struggling with its relationship with the West. Is West an ally? Is West an adversary? And we thought after the end of the Cold War, there was an opportunity to bring Russia permanently into the West. Uh, and, Putin, and Bush would say that to Putin. And Putin's answer was interesting. He said, that's what I want to do. But there are dark forces in Russia, and, you need, and it's important that they not be awakened. So you let, need to let me do it at my own time and in my own, pay, in my own way and at my own pace. So we thought, okay, we can do that. And there were, in the early days, there was discussions about how to establish a two-party system. And you may remember Putin actually established two parties. Then he decided it wasn't the Western two-party system. He wanted the Japanese model you know, a dominant party and then a lesser party. And then after a while he decided he didn't want two parties, actually real parties in the Western sense at all. And he chipped away at democratic institutions. So the dynamic in the transition memo is interesting. We are trying to build an ever more closer relationship with Russia. We got a lot of cooperation with Russia. It's in the transition memo. Uh, give you, you know, a, a couple examples. One, Putin and Bush come up with their own presidential exchange program to encourage Russian students to come to the United States, U.S. students go to Russia. We had a thing called the checklist, where cabinet secretaries, the Russian and U.S. equivalent cabinet secretary would agree on a joint project that they would pursue together, and they would write quarterly reports on their progress jointly to the two presidents. It's unheard of. So we're trying to strengthen the relationship, bring them west, but if you look at the transition memo, Putin is getting more and more authoritarian at home. And where we lose him is really the color revolutions of 2003, 4, and 5. In Georgia, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, uh, 
um, Lebanon. We thought these were good things. These were people trying to insist on re accountable governments that would be prosperous and stable, good neighbors for Russia. Putin didn't see it that way. He thought these uprisings were CIA front operations to install anti-Russian governments on his border and his address rehearsal for destabilizing Russia itself. So At that point, we lose him, and in 2008, he goes into Georgia. Right. So let me back you up one year from that. You had two other events. There was the Beslan uh, uh, tragedy, the, sh the shootings, which to some degree he blamed on U.S. support for the Chechens in his, in his mind. And then there was his speech at the Munich Security Conference, I think it was 2007, where Bob Gates then had to stand up and say, I haven't heard anything like this since the Cold War, and that's not really where I want to head back. Tell us a little bit about those two incidents. So David Ignatius picked up on this from a session we did at Brookings, and if you want, you ought to pull up his column. It's very interesting. His take, and I think Tom Graham, who wrote the postscript uh, in the book, is, agrees with this, that America was trying to make a distinction between terrorists and those Chechens who just wanted greater freedom. And for Putin, there was no distinction between the two. So he thought we were basically supporting terrorists and supporting terrorists that were trying to secede from Russia, which was not to his liking. The Munich speech, many people say, is a harbinger that we didn't pay enough attention to it. Bush sent me to go see Putin after the speech and find out what was on his mind. So I walked to see, went to see him, and it was very Putin-esque. He had himself on a high platform. Uh, about in six, his office at the Kremlin? Uh, in, a, in, a, in a room in the Kremlin, a large room, and he had himself on a desk on a dais, and I was about six feet down below him, you know, a staff person you're talking to the president of Russia. And he had a stack of three by, card, three by five cards. And each one was a separate grievance against the United States and against the West. And he went through them one by one, one by one. And I would try respectfully to answer as best I could, but I'm at a little bit disadvantage. Uh, so it's not particularly productive. And at the end of about an hour and a quarter, he stops it, comes down and says, thanks for coming. I'll see you anytime you come to Russia. So, you know, it's not clear what's going on in this man's mind. And a lot of people will say, well, he would, Putin was the Putin we have today all along. It was always about restoring Russian power. He thought initially he could do that in alliance with the West. That went south, was soured, so he decided he had to do it in Russia's own individual way as a sort of a separate civilization between East and West. I think over 20 years, you know, you learn. Most people learn over 20 years. I think Putin evolved over this period of time, and I think particularly during COVID when he was very isolated, buried away in the Soviet archives, learning history. And he came up with this notion that what Russia needs to do is reestablish, not the Soviet empire, but the Russian empire. Reestablish control over traditional Russian lands, which unfortunately includes the Baltic states, Moldova, Poland, a lot of other territory. And this is what the Ukraine is all about. It is basically ending Ukrainian sovereignty, ending its independence, bringing within Russia fold, because with Ukraine, Russia can be an empire, and without Ukraine, Russia can't. So one last question for you on Russia, and we'll move on to, to China, Steve. So you've heard in the past two or three years, as this has got better, and particularly since the invasion, a lot of Cold War analogies with Russia and China. I'll get to the China ones in a, in a moment. With China, I, I, I don't think they apply because of the economic, the nature of the economic relationship. But with Russia, what, if you think about what we are doing now to isolate them, cut off their exports, cut them out of SWIFT, and so forth, there is a lot of resemblance to Kennan era containment. What's different? Maybe. I, I, you know, when the, Russia went into Ukraine a second time in, in uh, February of 2022, I was trying to figure this out, and I didn't react as quickly as I should have, but one night I woke up at 3 in the morning, and I was thinking Sudetenland and Hitler. And I think the analogy is less the Cold War and more. This is a war of aggression and a war of expansion and a war of empire. And we're doing things that are appropriate to try to respond to that. 
Secondly, I think another thing that people haven't written about, you know, Putin's crusade against Ukraine is in some sense in the name of denazification of Ukraine. Well, if you look at the tactics Putin is pursuing both domestically and overseas, it's very Hitlerian. It's very Hitlerian. I think this is a war of aggression uh, apropos of sort of hmm. the, uh, the 20th century and less a sort of Cold War analogy, even though some of the tools are the same. So let's turn to China for a moment. So when you're reading the Russia section of your book, you see all these warning signs, right? There are all these little elements, whether it's Beslan or the color revolutions or, or the speech at Munich, you getting sent there. When you look at China, you get the reverse. You see two leaders who are um, trying to move China much more into economic integration. You took over just as China had gotten into the WTO in the very last days of the Clinton administration. Um, you built on that um, along the way. And really, the turn with China doesn't come, it seems to me, until long after you're out of office right. and Xi Jinping uh, uh, takes over. So um, tell us a little bit about China as you left it in, this, in these memos. Well, there's going to, a terrific panel that is going to follow this conversation David and I are having uh, with real experts on China, and I hope you all will stay tuned for that because they will elaborate on a lot of this. But I'll give you my view, and they can, uh, Dennis and Victor can amend and, and revise my remarks in the follow-up panel. The, the China we faced was a China that, that wanted a benign international environment so they could focus on their own domestic development. It was a China that did not want to overturn the international system but wanted to be a part of that system and made that very clear. It was a China that wanted a constructive relationship with the United States and we tried to, to build that. Um, and it, were, it was actually also, as Dennis Wilder reminded me, it was a China that was willing to hear Bush out on human rights and particularly religious freedom. When he first met John Zemin, Bush said to him, I'm going to raise religious freedom every time we meet. I just want to let you know that up front. Uh, I have to do it. It's, it's part of who I am. And so, you know, get ready. And now that doesn't mean we're not going to talk about other issues but I'm going to raise it every time. And we did. And uh, they were willing to talk about it in a way that the current regime would never do it. I remember we had a session with Wang Jiabao, the premier in, in China, and he at one point went out of his way to tell Bush how much religious freedom there was in China and how many Bibles there were in China. I mean, this is unheard of today. But that's, what, that's the leadership we had, and we thought, there's a reasonable chance, and every reason why it's in Americans' interest to try to bring China into the international system so they would be supportive of the international system, they would accept its values, underlying values, which were very much our values of freedom, democracy, human rights, and rule of law, and they wouldn't act contrary to our interests. But you also saw them, once they came in, as such a large player in the system, begin to try to change the system some move those rules more in their direction? They did. It's not surprising. Look, a, a lot of that system was designed when, before China was the China we have today. And it is fair to say, and not just for China, but for India and a lot of countries in the global south, the system was designed by the great powers that emerged after the end of World War II, and the world is vastly different now. And that international system needs to be revised and adapted to the new gen geopolitical realities, one of which is the emergence of China, but that is not the only one. We thought it was a reasonable bet that we could succeed in bringing China to, to, uh, into the international system. But as you, there, there are two memos, actually, transition memos in the book on China. One is on China, and the other is on East Asia security alliances. We hedged. We did a lot to strengthen our relationship and resolve differences with Seoul, with South Korea, with Japan, with Australia, with the Philippines even. We uh, established a strategic relationship with India, which as it turns out has been very important in giving the Biden administration a platform with which to deal with a China that decided in 2012 and thereafter when Xi Jinping came to power 
that it wanted to go in a different direction. So I have a memory, Steve, of coming in to see you toward the end of the administration one day, and it was like the day or two after the Chinese had just done their first ASAT test, their anti-satellite test. It was a fairly crude test, but it was relatively successful in blowing up, uh, I think, one of their own satellites. And then, as I recall, spreading debris all over uh, lower Earth orbit. It wasn't perhaps the most gracefully done uh, thing. I think the same people who uh, designed that must have done the balloon incident. Um, but um, did that give you a different view of what China was looking like? I, I don't have a great, I never had a great memory and it hasn't improved with age. Uh, so you can talk to Dennis and Victor about that. My, my recollection is this, one, what they did was a direct ascent assault on a satellite, which was not new and innovative technology. The Russians had had that capability for uh, probably a decade. Uh, so technologically, it wasn't a wake-up call. The wake-up call was that it was them doing it. Second, there is always a question under Hu Jintao is how much he knew what the military was doing. And so there was a question about whether they were surprised. So we decided our response was to be to really shine a spotlight on it, in some sense rally international opinion against what China had done because of the debris it put into the low Earth orbit and because of the threat that debris represented to the global satellite system. And our thought was if we do that, and if we make the point to the Chinese that they have stepped outside the bounds of the international system, it will be a lesson learned for them and they won't do it again. How'd that work That's out? That's how we <laughs> Well, it worked out actually pretty well because it didn't disrupt the relationship. But what's different now is here, 13, 14 years later, the Chinese have continued to work on anti-satellite capability and the kinds of techniques they have developed now are cutting edge, state of the art, and a real threat to the system in a way that direct ascent satellite interception really was not. Steve, since we will have Victor uh, Dennis up later on, there's one other thing that the Chinese have done that's radically different from your time. Obviously, you spent much of your career dealing with nuclear issues. Um, during the entirety of the Bush administration, they were happy to sit with a minimum deterrent. Now, by the Pentagon's own unclassified uh, estimate, they'll have roughly the number of deployed nuclear weapons that we have in 2035. I think that their estimate is 1,500, probably have 1,000 by, by uh, the end of this decade. What do you think is behind this? What, what is it that makes Xi Jinping think that the strategy that worked pretty well from 1964 when they did their first test until a few years ago now needs to be radically revised? Uh, I think it's embedded in his overall view of the world, which is, has been, I think, for a while, that the West is in decline, the United States is in terminal decline. As the Marxists would say, the correlation of forces favored China. And this is the moment for China to abandon Deng Xiaoping's hide and bide, which isn't really a reassuring idea if you think about it. It is building their, pie, their power but hiding it for a while. She was prepared to put his power center stage and then to use it to intimidate his neighbors and others abroad with his enhanced diplomacy, economic strength, and military capability. And basically to put China at the center of the international stage. And part of being at the international center of the international stage is having uh, a big-time nuclear force comparable to the United States and Russia, and that's what he's decided to build. A lot of these programs, as you know, were proceeding very slowly under prior presidents. He has accelerated them, he's expanded them, and he's clearly moved off of minimum deterrence. So there's a moment at the end of the China memos where you're sort of doing an assessment, and you say, we don't know what this is going to look like in 15 years, but we could have a very aggressive right. China as one option. As you left office, what did you think the chances of that, if you had to put percentage chances on it, what did you think the chances were that they would move in the, the aggressive direction that we have since seen? Based on the presidents that we dealt with, um, 
I think that we would we did we would not. Dennis can answer for himself. I did not anticipate what Xi Jinping represents in terms of a shift in Chinese policy. Um, you know, a lot of people say, well, the the roots of that shift were present during the Bush administration, and they would cite the fact that the Communist Party was still in existence. The Communist Party was still writing these documents, very Cold War sort of style documents. Um, but what we were seeing was a Chinese Communist Party that was very much in eclipse, that governmental institutions were taking more and more authority, that the ideology of the Communist Party really had no traction within the population particularly. Uh, and my view now, I'm not sure it was at the time, is you know, who leads countries really matters. And I think if China decided in 2012 for a Jiang Zemin or Hu Jintao type leader, and we had had that leader for 2012 to 2022, I think China would be in a very different place today, and America's relationship with China would be very uh, different today. And I'd say one other thing. If we had not tried, while we did hedge our bet by strengthening alliances, if we had not tried to bring China into the international system, and I, as I say, I think for the reasons I described, we thought it was a reasonable shot. We'd be having a debate right now about who lost China. And some people would be arguing, and I would be defending up here against David Sanger saying to me, it was you aggressive Cold War Bush administration that did not see the opportunity presented by Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao and forced China into an adversarial relationship with the United States. Uh, that can't be said. One last on this, and I'll have a few other quick topics we want to hit before we turn over to the panel. Um, the, the opening foreign policy crisis for the Bush administration was the downing of the P3. Uh, and my, my overwhelming memory of this period is you're trying to get the Chinese government <laughs> on the phone. Um, Colin Powell, uh, tearing his hair out because no one would answer the phone. He had some vivid words on that later on. Um, and then you established, that led to sort of some establishment of sort of hotline kind of communications things. Along comes the balloon incident that I referred to the other day, or as, as um, President Biden said to us in Japan on, uh, on, on Sunday, the um, silly sending of the balloon. I thought that was an interesting phrase to, to use for it. And again, they try all of these communication systems that really have their roots in what you set up, and no one answers the phone. And we are, at that point, nearly 20 years out, more than 20 years out from the original incident, actually. Um, what's going on there? So uh, a couple things. One, um, this was a collision between a hot dog in China fighter pilot and a U.S. surveillance aircraft that forced the aircraft down in Hanan Island, and the Chinese held the crew and held the airplane. And the question is, we wanted them both back in reverse order, crew first, airplane later. You got the airplane back. It was in a box about this big, as I recall. <laughs> <Many boxes. laughs> Pieces. They, they, did, they gave it a good going over, as yeah. we would say. Um, so there wasn't really an established, we, we would co coordinate that crisis every morning at three o'clock in the morning our time. Connie and Powell and Rumsfeld and I would get on the phone and talk about what we were gonna do and we would have the ambassador and the ambassador who was a wonderful guy at the time, former Navy Admiral, was working it in Beijing but not getting much traction. We decided the president needed to speak to John Zemin so we tried to get John Zemin on the phone. John Zemin was in Africa and refused to take the call for four or five days. Uh, so what's going on here? Well, one, we don't have established channels that everybody recognizes if there is a confrontation, this is the channel and this is the phone line that you use. So we got those. But secondly, the Chinese government, and I think this changes under Hu Jintao and one, in, under Xi Jinping in one set, one sense, it's not internally organized to get prompt decisions in response to this. And part of the delay is they don't know what to say. For example, I am told, and Dennis may know better, I'm told that one of the reasons why uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense couldn't get in touch with his counterpart over the balloon incident 
was because if the Minister of Defense for China were to take Lloyd Austin's call, it would be an admission that it was a military incident, and the Chinese view was it's a civilian incident. It's a weather balloon. Indeed, our intelligence, I'm told, uh, I, I, th I think we've said this publicly, that um, Xi Jinping still thinks it was a weather balloon, and his people don't want to tell him otherwise. So part of the problem is there isn't a good decision-making process within the Chinese government that is based on real, reliable, real-time information. There's a third problem, which is why we don't have protocols for de-escalation crises if U.S. aircraft and Chinese aircraft or ships get into it in the South China Sea, East China Sea, or the Taiwan Strait. The Chinese view is we shouldn't be with our military forces in the East China Sea, South China Sea, and Taiwan Strait. And if they agree to communications channels and de-escalation protocols for how to avoid an incidence there, it in some sense acknowledges and justifies American military presence that they don't think should be there at all. So I thought that was a pretty good ar argument, so I talked to my colleague, Condi Rice, and I said, they make this argument, what should I say? And she said, in the way that Condi would, Tell them the reason to have those things is if we don't have them, there's a risk of U.S. and China going to war, and that would be bad for China. I think that's a pretty good answer. Yeah. Um, last one, since I know we're getting close here on, on time, or actually last two. There's a lot of fascinating stuff about where you left the relationship <laughs> with Africa. The president, of course, had um, done a lot along the way, Millennium Challenge, which, uh, Millennial Challenge, which I think may be one of the, one of the proudest uh, foreign policy legacies of the, of the Bush administration. Um, when you go back and you read those today, you have a little bit of a sense of momentum lost in, across administrations, not just the Obama administration that followed, but the Trump administration, and maybe you could even say the Biden administration. Um, why is that? Do I, am I reading it right? Uh, yes and no. Interestingly enough, um, there were three things that Bush administration did. One, we resolved, helped the, helped the countries and regional organizations in Africa resolve six regional conference conflicts that had killed hundreds of thousands and really ravaged economies. To set up then a new approach to development reflected in the Millennium Challenge account, which was one of partnership rather than donor donor relationship. And then three, dealing with diseases, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases that really threatened development and the middle class in Africa, and programs that have, have together have saved more than 35 million lives. All of those programs have been continued under subsequent administrations despite all the tumult that has occurred in, during those administrations. That's the good news. The bad news is that America's, and Americans are pulling back from a global uh, leadership role because there are a lot of problems and grievances they have here at home that need to be addressed, and they do need to be addressed. But I think the thing is the Americans are naturally isolationists. That is to say their priority is things here at home as well it should be. And so in that sense, America first isn't nuts. It's where Americans are. If America is going to engage abroad and take major burdens abroad, whether it's war or whether it's something like HIV AIDS, the President of the United States needs to explain why we should do it and why it benefits America here at home and makes America safer and more prosperous. That's the job of the President, and President Bush did it over and over again. I think or more recent presidents, for whatever reason, aren't doing that. And if I would make one suggestion to the, about the Biden administration about your effort in Ukraine, I would say that President Biden has been very good about showing that we're going to be steadfast and standing by Ukraine as long as it takes. But Ukraine doesn't have as long as it takes uh, in standing up against Russia. And what the president, I think, needs to do more of is explain to the American people why it is important to the American people and to our safety and security here at home for Ukraine to succeed in, uh, against Russia in this terrible war. One last thing. Um, uh, Victor wouldn't uh, forgive me if I didn't ask you about this, but there's a lot in the book about proliferation, yeah. and particularly about North Korea and Iran, uh, two topics we talked about a lot when you were uh, 
you were in office. Um, in both cases, you'd have to say, I think, that 15 years later, we're in dramatically worse place than we were then. And it didn't look so hot at the time. I mean, you bet. Right. Uh, just to remind, at the time that you were at getting toward the end of, of the Bush administration, North Korea had, what, probably half a dozen to a dozen nuclear weapons. We didn't know exactly the number. Today, the low end of the estimates is probably 60. The South Koreans believe it may be up to 100. Um, you had done some things to set back the Iranian program. I wrote about a few of them, uh, you may recall. We're um, not going to talk about those. Yeah, I, I suspect we won't. Um, <laughs> we never have. <laughs> um, but, um, but today, we're in a position where the Iranians, just based on, on open source, are, have produced enough 60% enriched uranium that by the administration's public accounting, they would have enough for uh, a crude weapon, not something that you could fit into a missile, within a matter of, of weeks if they decided to go for it. When you look back at, at where you left things, anything different that you feel now that you needed to do? Anything that you felt the Obama administration uh, or the Trump administration that followed you missed a major opportunity for? So I, this is an area where, it, with respect to North Korea and, and Iran, and we have, a, I think, a good story to tell, which is told in the book about countering proliferation more generally. Mm -hmm. But with respect to North Korea and Iran, this is a case where efforts by one, two, three, four, five administrations across parties are unblemished by sustainable success. It's been a remarkable failure. I'll talk about Bush administration and, and explain why I think we ended up where we are and Victor can comment on this. So go back to 2001, two and three. We go into Afghanistan with a few 1,500 or so US intelligence official of, uh, officers and special uh, operations folks from the military topple the Taliban government. Uh, March, April 2003, we toppled the Iraqi government in short order. Both of the, those wars were justified in part by preventing al-Qaeda in one hand and Saddam Hussein in the other from getting weapons of mass destruction. I would say because of that, in that same time frame, 2003, Gaddafi voluntarily comes forward and gives up his weapons of mass destruction program. And the Iranians, we know from intelligence, suspended their <clears throat> covert enrichment program and their covert weaponization program. Why? Because they thought they were going to be next with U.S. military power, which we put on display in Afghanistan, Iraq, with great effect. They actually, uh, North Korea gets the message. We enter in the six-party talks, of which Victor was a big part. And in September 2005, they enter into an agreement where they give up their nuclear program altogether, both weaponization and their domestic nuclear program. And the EU3, Germany, France, and the UK, in 2004, get an agreement with the Iranians where they give up their nuclear program, both weapons and peaceful as well. So it looks like we're on a roll, and we're going to roll up global proliferation in nuclear weapons. What happens? I would say, my view, we get bogged down in Iraq, we get bogged down in Afghanistan. Uh, and the Iranians and the North Koreans decide that we have neither the capability nor the will to enforce the writ against proliferation. So Ahmadi Najad... An accurate read of the room at that time. Uh, Ahmadi Najad in 2005 becomes president in Iran, says those people negotiated the deal with the EU3 are traitors and ought to be in, gen in jail, and gets Iran back in the nuclear program, and the North Koreans over time walk away from the September 2005 deal. We lost our leverage, and the f both fish got off the hook. I think that's the grim tale of what happened. And, you know, President Bush, in a bold decision for the surge in Iraq, actually succeeds in turning around the war in Iraq, defeating al-Qaeda in Iraq, and puts Iraq on a path for moving towards stability. But it comes too late. It comes too late. We've already lost the game with both the North Koreans and the Iranians. That's how I see it. 
Well, <clears throat> we could do this all morning and well into the afternoon <laughs> and have at times, but we've got a great panel coming ahead. So Steve, I want to thank you for writing the book, for pushing through the declassification. Um, for those of us who um, covered this, follow this history, are still writing about it, it's an incredible contribution. And um, thank you all for joining the conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to part two. Uh, my name is Nick Say Cheney. I'm a senior fellow with the Japan Chair and Deputy Director for Asia here at CSIS. Uh, and it's a real pleasure for me to moderate uh, a panel with such distinguished experts to carry forward uh, a very rich conversation on uh, U.S. foreign policy at the end of the Bush administration and the implications for U.S. strategy in, in Asia today. Uh, I'll briefly introduce our panelists, and then we'll, we'll get right into it. Uh, on the far right, my far right, is Dennis Wilder, a uh, senior fellow for the Initiative for U.S.-China Dialogue on Global Issues at Georgetown University. Uh, next to him is Chris Johnstone, a senior advisor and Japan chair here at CSIS. Uh, we're delighted to be also be joined by Bonnie Lin, who's a senior fellow for Asian Security and director of the China Power Project here at CSIS. Uh, and next to me, uh, Victor Cha, uh, Senior Vice President for Asia and, and Korea Chair uh, here at CSIS, uh, also at, at Georgetown University. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, Dennis, you uh, wrote several of the memos um, that are in the book. So I thought best to start with you um, and sort of uh, allow you to share your key takeaways uh, from, that, from that period of time, okay. just to get us started. Sure. Well. Let me first say what a privilege it was to work for President Bush. I was in the White House for five years. What a privilege it was to work for Dr. Rice and then for Steve Hadley. Um, it really was a dream team on foreign policy and their interest in East Asia was strong. One of the things I wanna start by saying, and I'm gonna tell a few little war stories here, um, but one thing that people didn't understand, people say the administration was preoccupied with the war on terror, Iraq, Afghanistan, and you know basically we couldn't walk and chew gum at the same time. This just wasn't true. President Bush's engagement with East Asian leaders was remarkable. And let me, let me tell you a few stories. Steve already referred to the first meeting the president had with Jiang Zemin. The interesting thing about that meeting, it's, it's only five weeks after 9-11. And the president made the decision to go to Asia even though we were in pretty well in turmoil at that moment. In fact, US Air Force jets had to get permission to fly with Air Force One into Chinese airspace, and the Chinese said yes. But in that meeting with Jiang Zemin, the president was very clear. He wanted China to join us in the war on terror, but he also said to Jiang Zemin, but you will not use this to go after your Muslim populations. Because he understood that there was a danger with the Uyghur situation and other situations in China that, that, the, that the Chinese might take this as an opportunity. And he also said to Jiang Zemin, as Steve said, I'm going to always raise the issue of human rights with you. But he went even further, and this was one of my duties that was really difficult. Every time we went to Beijing, and we went three times to Beijing, I would have to find a church for the president to go to. He and Laura Bush would say to me, we're going to church. And I would go to the Chinese foreign ministry and say, we're going to church. And of course, they really loved that idea. Um, and they would search everybody at the church. They would give the churches trouble. But it was something that the president just felt deeply, Laura Bush felt deeply, um, and, and it, was, it was symbolic, but very meaningful. By the way, he also forced me to do this in Hanoi, and we for, had the first ecumenical service ever in Hanoi. I had to get the Protestants and the Catholics to decide on a liturgy that they could both agree to, and it was a very interesting process. Um, but, but this was President Bush. Uh, the other thing um, I would say is the president knew how to use a meeting very successfully with, with Chinese leaders. And I'll give you the example of Hu Jintao at APEC in 
in September 2007, and Steve seems to be remembering this. I had no idea this was coming up, by the way. But the president sat down with Hu Jintao and said, Mr. President, I'm going to tell you something you are not going to like. And Hu Jintao sort of raises out of his seat, very uncomfortable. And the president says, Nancy Pelosi has asked me to join her in giving the Dalai Lama the Congressional Gold Medal. And I'm going to do that next month. And Hu Jintao starts moving and clearly about ready to launch. And the president says, wait a minute. I have a second message for you. I will be at your Summer Olympics next year. There are many Americans who are unsure I should do this, but I'm going to be there. And frankly, we got through the Dalai Lama ceremony with not a word from the Chinese. It was amazing. And this was a special ability, I think, that Bush had in dealing with them, where he stood his ground on human rights, but also showed the Chinese respect. And I just add one more area, and that is, it wasn't just with the Chinese. With the Japanese, Koizumi. The Koizumi relationship was absolutely special. And it starts at Camp David in September of 2007. Um, and what, what did Bush get the Japanese to do? Well, for one thing, the Japanese sent combat forces for the first time ever to Iraq. This was a huge change. It was difficult for Koizumi to get through the diet, but it was a tremendous change that starts Japan down the road to what sometimes is referred to, and Chris can talk more about this, but a normal nation um, on the defense side. Secondly, agreement to have nuclear-powered aircraft carriers in Japan. This was a hard thing to do because of the Japanese public attitude, but Koizumi saw that through. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, then we have the really odd moment where I walk into the Oval Office one morning, I'm sure Steve was with me, and the president says, we're going to take a road trip. This was in 2007. I said, what, Mr. President, what's a road trip? He said, we're going to Graceland. I barely knew where Graceland was on a map, let alone how much of a shrine it was to Elvis. But Koizumi loves Elvis, still does, has, has actually recorded albums of Elvis's music. And it was just the most remarkable event because it was an American president showing great respect to a foreign leader. Um, and so we took Air Force One. We played Elvis's songs in Air Force One going out there. Uh, Koizumi got to um, sing with the band at lunchtime at a famous barbecue restaurant. Um, and so I, I just want to get across, and we'll get to more substantive things in a moment here, that Bush did have a remarkable ability, and it's one that I wish American presidents more often had at this personal diplomacy. And it was something he learned from his father, um, who was also very good at this. And I'll turn it over to you. Excellent. A great way to kick off the conversation with President Bush's emphasis on, on personal diplomacy, both with China, as Mr. Hadley noted, where the administration was trying to integrate China into the international system, uh, but also hedge by strengthening, strengthening uh, alliances um, in the region. Uh, let me turn to, to Bonnie for um, your comments on the extent to which um, the relationship with China has, has changed. Uh, where we're now in an environment where the emphasis is overwhelmingly on strategic competition, uh, and there's a real struggle to even have high-level engagement with China, and I would repeat the question we heard in the first panel, um, not to put you on the spot, but I'd be fascinated in your views. Um, if Xi Jinping answers the phone, does he know what to say? Where, where are we uh, about the, in terms of the prospects for, for high-level diplomacy today? So, Bonnie, please. Thank you. I think it's a hard act to follow, Dennis, but um, I'll focus initially my comments on looking at the uh, 
transition memo and highlighting where I think are some of the key differences and similarities on where the Biden administration is. And then go back to your question on Anega, what happens if she answers the phone? Um, what really struck me in the, uh, the transition memo that was in the, this excellent book, it's very heavy, um, but also really make, makes me very useful for, you know, uh, writing on top of uh, the paper. <laughs> um, what, what, I, what I found really interesting was how it assessed China, and I'll, I'm just going to quote a couple lines because I think that those are not the lines that we see anymore, but I think Perhaps there are some elements of how the Bush administration was very cautious on China that we might, we might, uh, we might want to think about as we look at the China challenge. So I thought it was quite interesting that um, the memo talks about how China is suspicious about the United States and worries that the United States would treat China as its main adversary and strategic threat. Obviously, that shifted after 9-11, but that just shows like how deep the distrust China has had for the United States, spanning decades. But what is interesting in the memo is the quote, the present strategy also recognizes that China's strategic future remains uncertain and that thus it is prudent to engage in contingency planning. I would argue that right now in the United States, there's much less uncertainty about the direction of China, right? So if you look at our current national security strategy, it's very clear that China is our main strategic and geopolitical challenge, and it's very clear what uh, it is very clear that we are relatively certain about this challenge, right? Our NSS writes that, uh, quote, the PRC harbors the intention increasingly the capacity to reshape international order in favor of one that tilts a global playing field to its benefit. So I do think it is useful as we look at China, um, particularly uh, having had you know, 20 years of history since the Bush administration to, un to recognize that, yes, that might be the trajectory that China is on, but uh, there is also significant degrees of uncertainty. And uh, to actually quote Steve from a, another um, session I had with him, I think our whatever strategy that we have for China needs to be able to be robust enough such that it can deal with all these contingencies. But on the other hand, in the off chance that post Xi Jinping we have a leader in China that we can work with, our strategy needs to be a, to be flexible enough to deal with it. I think there is a danger uh, in the direction that we are trending in DC that we are um, not able to necessarily be able to communicate with China the way that we were able to during the Bush administration. I would also note the key difference in the uh, Bush memo and, and what we're seeing now with respect to how we, are, how we think about shaping China's behavior. I was struck by how much the memo talked about building good relations with China through bilateral, multilateral engagement, the uh, emphasis on both cooperation and engagement. Um, it's hard to really quantify where we are now, sort of in terms of cooperation engagement on one side and deterrence on the other side. But I would probably say that right now the center of gravity in DC is more on the deterrence side when it comes to China and probably a bit less on the uh, cooperation and engagement side. Not, not of, of course, not uh, necessarily at the fault always on the US side, right? We've talked about how we've tried to pick up the phone with the Chinese, we've tried to call the Chinese and the Chinese don't pick up. But we, but we do see now in DC much more of a sense that we need to shape the external environment of which China operates in, which is clearly laid out in our national security strategy. Uh, and there is still a desire for cooperation. There still is a desire for engagement, but we're no longer placing as much hope on those elements to shape China. So again, a different emphasis and a different balancing compared to what we saw um, in, in this memo. And the other thing I wanted to highlight and re-emphasize was what I found really interesting in the memo was the por uh, portion on personal bonds are key. And he, we had talked about how, um, how Jiang Zemin's first impression of President Bush was very much shaped by the fact that right after 9-11, uh, President Bush was willing to travel to China, right? Make a, a foreign trip, which is a, um, a, one could argue is very difficult when you have so many problems to deal with at home. And of course, we, Dennis, you also mentioned that President Bush had attended China's Summer Olympics in 2008 against, against pressures and against, uh, I guess, some of the criticism for him to not go. I think it's interesting to contrast that with what we've seen in the past uh, a year or two where we did not see President Biden attend China's Winter Olympics in February 2022. And it's my personal view that if President Biden had attended, I don't think we would have seen the China-Russia joint statement there, right? Because if he did, uh, sorry, if President Biden did, uh, President Biden would have been 
uh, rightfully so, a center of attention for that, and you wouldn't have seen Putin being elevated in that, that respect. Whether you know, China and Russia would have continued to, to strengthen their relationship, I definitely agree that probably would have continued. But I do believe that his absence at that world stage did provide China more rationale to lean in the direction of Russia that we would, might not have seen uh, before, uh, before that. Uh, I think it, we've also hear again and again from the Chinese side that, um, uh, that, when, that they very much watch the words of President Biden and President Biden's comments specifically about Xi Jinping have been very much noted by the Chinese. And that's where we've seen since this March of uh, President Biden's comments in the State of the Union, like specifically against Xi Jinping, has caused China to take a more of a, um, a, uh, a different turn on, uh, with respect to the United States. But I would emphasize that what we're still continuing to see in recognition in this administration, the Biden administration, is the need for a very high level dialogue. And that's where we see continued emphasis on President Biden being able to speak directly with Xi Jinping with the recognition that given how much China has centralized power under Xi, very different than under Hu Jintao, who was going in sort of the opposite direction, inviting more collective leadership that is even more important for, um, for the two leaders to maintain that personal bond. Uh, so I'll wrap it up here, but happy to go back to any of these points. Can I just please go ahead? Intervention. Um, I think there are two points I want to make. One is we did try to figure out Xi Jinping in the administration. Uh, when we went to the 2008 Olympics, Xi Jinping was actually in charge of the Olympics. So we were able to get a meeting for the president with Xi Jinping. And we were all very excited to meet this guy because nobody really understood him. And I thought I would dine for years in Washington on being one of the first people to actually <laughs> sit down with Xi Jinping. And I gotta tell you, it was one of the most boring meetings I'd ever been in. <laughs> Xi Jinping gave nothing. He was cardboard. He wasn't going to tell us a thing about himself. He was not gonna show his hand. And this is how he got to the top of the Chinese system. He did hide his cards. There is a reason why we were all surprised by Xi Jinping, because the nature of the man, the nature of the way he came to power was to hide. And in fact, everybody thought he would be a reformist because his father had been a reformist. And so if you look at the early assessments, everybody thought we're gonna have another reformist Chinese leader. The second point I would make is, I mentioned President Bush's emphasis on human rights. I should have added that President Bush was able to get dissidents released from China in a way we haven't been able to since. Rabia Qadir, the head of the Uyghur World Congress in 2005, just before a visit by Secretary Rice to Beijing, they released her and we put a lot of pressure on the Chinese. There were several Christian dissidents that we got released. So um, there was success in these areas that, frankly, I don't think we would find today. Appreciate uh, both of your comments. Um, importance of high level engagement, but also a recognition that personalities matter and that we have to adjust um, accordingly. But personality is a good way to uh, transfer, uh, transition, excuse me, to Chris. Um, for your comments on uh, both the Bush-Koizumi relationship, um, developments in the alliance with Japan and, and other allies during that period. So yeah, sure, thanks, Nick. Um, uh, let, let me start with a, a couple of comments about, first of all, the book and the contents of this book. Um, Dennis, and I think your memos, just a lot, you deserve a lot of credit for the, the, the prescience you had for the world we were going to, to face. First point I would make is, it really is extraordinary. These are transition memos for the next team can't lose sight of that, how significant that is. Uh, this was a commitment on the part of the Bush administration to help the Obama administration get off to a fast start uh, with the critical foreign policy issues of the day. I was on the, the, the National Security Council staff under Obama and then again later under Biden, so I was sort of the inheritor, if you will, one of the inheritors of your work. Uh, and I remember in 2016, we were beginning to prepare for the transition. And Susan Rice stood up in a, in a sort of an all hands with, with the NSC staff to say, the president has said to me that George Bush gave him a terrific transition. Uh, and we're gonna do the same for the team that comes next. 
So I think you know, the message that you all sent uh, with this was very important and was, was carried forward. And I can't speak to how much <laughs> what the Obama administration provided was used by the next group, but I think we, there was a heavy emphasis uh, placed on it. A, a quick point on China. I think, um, you know, as I think about the Obama administration's China policy, a lot of continuity, really, with the Bush approach. We were still focused, I think, largely on the idea that China could be integrated into the existing system, made to be a responsible stakeholder, and could become a partner, in a sense, on the critical issues of the day. And I think that was the dominant approach for most of the administration. It was starting to change at the end with the emergence of South, the South China Sea issue, the rise of things like the cyber theft uh, issue that became a focus of, of Xi's visit to the, to the White House in 2015. Um, and I was part of a drafting team that wrote uh, a presidential policy directive in the 2015 timeframe sort of codifying the Obama administration's Asia policy. Uh, and I think when that document is released, and hopefully it will be, it will indicate the China section, I think, really sort of tees up a more competitive approach to the relationship. I think that was beginning to happen uh, by the 2015 timeframe. There were still divisions within the U.S. system. There were divisions between Treasury and DOD, for example, on, uh, on how to think about the, the relationship. You can imagine what the roots of those differences were. Um, uh, but but it, was starting, uh, it was starting to turn, still fundamentally grounded in the view that China was shapeable and an engagement would shape it. I do also remember, though, at that time we were beginning to see differences with our allies on that question. And I remember distinctly a bilateral discussion with some Japanese counterparts led by the NSC in which my counterpart said to me, we no longer believe that China is shapeable. Uh, and we need to think differently about this relationship. So it was interesting to think about, to look back and see how, how the region was beginning to change uh, as well. A few points, uh, quick points on allies, Nick, which is what you asked me to address. Forgive me for taking so long to get it. First of all, I think, um, Dennis, the language you have in your memo about we are going to engage China with and through our allies, that's a fundamental insight that I think guides the Biden administration today that, that we're doing, that, that our policy toward China starts with allies. Um, that is very much the philosophy of the Biden administration. If you think about how the Biden administration started, it began with heavy engagement of our allies, inviting Suga to Washington, uh, inviting um, President Moon Jae-in to Washington, get those relationships in good shape, and then engage the Chinese. I think that's very much guided by the, um, by the philosophy that you, that, that's articulated in your memo. Second, this question of counterparts. Uh, totally agree on, on the importance of personal diplomacy, and I think the Bush-Koizumi um, relationship is a, great, is a great example of that. I am reminded of how much counterparts matter. <laughs> um, this is also the time of a pretty difficult time in the relationship with Korea uh, because of, of, the, of the leader there. Um, and then I think about Obama, who started the relationship with Japan under Prime Minister Hatoyama, which I think was a particular dark period in, in that alliance that colored really their view of Japan for, for eight years in some sense. Um, so, so counterparts also matter. The other relationship that comes to mind for me in your period was the president's relationship with John Howard uh, right. and the elevation of, of the relationship with Australia. I mean, we think about Australia as a Five Eyes partner now as if it's a given, but, but it was under you all that you really elevated the information sharing with Australia, particularly related to CT, but um, uh, on other issues as well that I think has served to cement that relationship um, for the long term. The last point I would just make um, uh, for my initial comments is um, I do think it's, uh, I, I think you're exactly right, Dennis, about the, the walking and chewing gum at the same time that we were able to do uh, diplomacy in Asia at the same time we were prosecuting the wars in Afghanistan and and Iraq, I do think it's fair to say that our engagement in Asia was colored by our focus in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? And the, and the, the um, you know, the, uh, we spent a lot of time um, encouraging our allies to contribute to our policy outside of Asia, right? And so I, th I, th I do agree that the, the Japanese contribution in Iraq was significant. It set the stage for uh, what came later under Abe it also consumed a huge amount of bandwidth uh, in the relationship. I was a desk guy in the Pentagon at the time, and the amount of staff time we used 
helping the Japanese to find the, the, the part of Iraq where they were going to send their forces sort of uh, squeezed out our ability to do a lot, of, a lot of other stuff. I don't know if you remember, we actually had to surround them with Mongolian troops because the Japanese and could not, I believe. and because they couldn't fire on anybody. And so, um, and actually a Mongolian soldier saved the compound at one point by taking out a terrorist who was coming in a vehicle with a bomb. So a big part of it is I think about the pivot to Asia under Obama, and there are reasons, of course, to be a little cynical about that. It was about bringing the focus of our policy back to Asia and the focus of our alliances in Asia back to Asia. So that's the start of the force posture initiatives with, with Australia that have led to things like AUKUS uh, and where we are today. La last quick point. I'm, I'm consuming a lot of bandwidth. Two, two things in your um, memos that talk about priorities in the near term for the alliance with the, with Korea and the alliance with Japan. The first is OPCON transition, transition of wartime operational control. We must complete that by 2012, you say. Uh, and then the movement, relocation of Marines from, from Okinawa to Guam by 2014, you, you say. We haven't done either of those things yet. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out it's hard to, uh, to make change in government, particularly in the Department of Defense. Excellent. Chris, thanks. We're going to transition to North Korea in a second. But Victor, first I want to give you a chance to react to what you've heard. and. Sure. Any recollections you want to share on sure. managing China and our allies? Um, so first, I want to say that this really is an amazing project uh, handoff. I've never seen anything like it. Um, for those of you um, out there in the scholarly world, it's a great teaching tool. I plan to use it in my classes as well because it's really an upfront, up close view, first row uh, seat view of what it looks like. And uh, and they, Steve and everybody do deserve a lot of credit for it, really terrific. Um, and the Asia memos in particular, you know, I had left the administration by then, but Dennis, I can't imagine this was a big job to put together these memos over the course of two, you know, two terms. Um, I was with the administration during the second term. Um, so let me make a couple of points about alliances. Um, the first is that um, I think that um, the external environment at the time had be changed in such a way that it forced uh, us to push our alliances beyond their bounds. So 9-11, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan created a situation in which our alliances uh, were asked to and were willing to move beyond what they've done before with us, particularly out of area. Um, so the South Koreans had the third largest ground contingent in Iraq. They were in northern Iraq, but they were there. Uh, the Japanese were in Iraq. They also had um, the Marine Self-Defense Forces in the Indian Ocean uh, in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. These were things we had never seen, our ally and Australians, of course, were in combat. Um, these are things that um, for decades we'd not seen, and in some cases had never seen our allies do before. Uh, and so it... Uh, it served to really consolidate and expand the domain, the scope and domain of our alliance, uh, of our military alliance relationships. The second point I would make is that um, what we have not talked about yet with regard to alliances is the trade architecture. We saw a, a deepening of all of our alliances uh, in Asia at the time because of the trade agenda of the administration. Uh, uh, free trade agreements with Australia, uh, trade and investment framework agreement with Singapore and the Chorus Free Trade Agreement with South Korea. The last of these, the Chorus Free Trade Agreement, uh, really became the prototype of the sort of high standards, blue ribbon free trade agreement that was not just about reducing tariffs, but also about um, um, affecting labor regulations, uh, environmental regulations in the countries that we did these agreements with. And of course, that became the prototype for uh, other free trade agreements that followed. Um, and of course, the, the plan of the administration at the time was to a building block, block approach to use these, you know, TIFA with Singapore, the Australia Free Trade Agreement, CHORUS, to use these to eventually get to something called FTAP, which you talk about in your memo, the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. Maybe hard to think about these things today, but, but they were a very important part of deepening uh, and the resilience of these uh, military alliance relationships such that they were not just about military issues and they were things that benefited the American people, right? I mean, remember there was one time we were uh, 
together talking points for the president for his meeting with on Howard. And um, there was a line where it was something like the, uh, the U.S.-Australia free trade agreement has led to an increase in U.S. exports to Australia and everything from dog food to airplanes or something to that effect. And, and he didn't like dog food. So we had to find something. I think we ended up with peanut butter or something else. But it was, <laughs> but it was, um, but there, you know, there was clearly a message about how these things were not just good for our alliance relationships, but also for the for the American people. Third point is um, with regard to, and we talked about this backstage. Uh, all of the Biden administration's focus on coalitional diplomacy, rightly the focus on coalitional diplomacy. We saw um, the first iteration of this during the during the um, the, the Bush administration. Um, <clears throat> my first week, my first week, Dennis will remember this well, at the NSC was when the tsunami hit um, the, in South and Southeast Asia. And that, of course, was the genesis of the Quad, right? Uh, U.S., Japan, India, and Australia. Um, the trilateral strategic dialogue, U.S., Japan, Australia, was also something that started uh, at this time in the, in the Bush administration. The six party talks um, was an effort, the first effort, sort of a multi uh, security organization in Northeast Asia, focused on a very specific problem, North Korean denuclearization, uh, but it was something that had not been tried before. Um, and then, of course, U.S., Japan, South Korea trilateral. So there were, I think, a lot of efforts in, in that regard. And then finally, of course, the civil nuclear deal. Steve talked about it, the civil nuclear deal with India, uh, and an attempt to really transform that relationship. So I think there was a lot that was uh, accomplished um, uh, with regard to that, that have a clear through line to, to the current situation. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, we can't have this conversation without talking about North Korea, which, no Victor, you've mentioned several times is the, what's the phrase you use? The, the land of imperfect options. Um, but the book does a really good job of explaining the philosophy of the Bush administration, which was to multilateralize the, chi uh, the challenge. You mentioned the six party talks and also address it uh, in the context of the UN Security Council, uh, but also not just talk about denuclearization, but also human rights challenges um, in, in North Korea and other issues. So I'd welcome um, sort of your reflections on, on that period and uh, where you think we are on North Korea strategy today. Um, so let me just make two quick points, and I mean, Dennis should chime in as well on this. The first is that um, this is my personal view. Uh, I, I think that of all the efforts, Steve talked about five administrations have tried to deal with this perennial problem. I think of all the efforts, and there were, there were, the, there were many and they were consistent across administrations. Uh, arguably, I think the six party talks got the farthest in terms of denuclearizing North Korea. Now, of course, that may mean nothing today because as David said, we're now like at 80 to 100 North Korean nuclear weapons versus half a dozen at the time, but if we think about the stages of denuclearization, freeze, disablement, dismantlement, I would argue that the six party talks got the furthest along that spectrum. Of course, in the end, we did not succeed, but it got the furthest along that spectrum towards dismantlement where we actually saw the collapse of the cooling tower uh, in, in Yongbyon. So, for whatever that's worth, I think it's, it, it's worth mentioning. The second is that there was this popular perception out there that President Bush did not want to negotiate with North Korea, that, uh, that the administration had basically a neoconservative agenda to collapse the North Korean regime. Um, and that could not have been um, f further from true. Um, uh, the U.S. position had always been peaceful diplomacy um, with regard to North Korea, peaceful negotiation, peaceful diplomacy, um, uh, to trying to find a negotiated uh, solution. And as I think the memo states, um, there were, um, we spent many hours, weeks, months uh, negotiating with North Korea bilaterally and in the six party talks to try to make that happen. Um, the third point I would make is when I look at the six party talks in the context of the history of the negotiation with North Korea, um, it was sort of the middle piece 
that was that uh, was a testament to the U.S. willing to try all sorts of different efforts to get to denuclearization. The first effort was during the Clinton administration, which focused on very direct bilateral talks with North Korea. Um, the innovation during the Bush administration was to multilateralize the problem, to bring China in as an important stakeholder in this, a very important stakeholder in this. And then the third iteration was what we saw during the Trump administration was to do the very direct leader-to-leader -leader talks. Now, in the end, all of these failed, but I think of the three different templates for dealing with North Korea, to me, the one that still makes the most sense is one that is much more of a regional approach. The North Korean nuclear problem is not just a U.S. problem. It's a regional problem, and the United States has some influence and some levers, but we don't have all of them. Uh, China has very important levers, as do the South Koreans, as do the Japanese, as do arguably the Russians. So um, this still seems to me like the best approach. We tried it. We got pretty far. Um, in the end, uh, you know, we really don't know, but part of the issue was the North Korean leader had a stroke, which we found out about later on. So we'll never know how that story ended up, but, um, but still to me that seems like the most uh, logical and practical approach uh, to dealing with this, so. Dennis or others want to chime in on North yeah, Korea? I, I think terrific points by Victor, and you have to understand, Victor was really our point man on this subject. Um, just did tremendous work working with Chris Hill at the State Department. I, I would make a couple points, and they're really related to the Biden administration. I am worried that we've we've had diplomacy fatigue with the North Koreans, and that we seem to now kind of mouth a mantra that we're ready to talk, but we have a part-time negotiator who is also our ambassador in Indonesia. We don't seem to be putting much into it at this point for very good reasons. The North Koreans are incredibly difficult to deal with, um, and negotiations are slow and difficult and very unrewarding. But I, I think that the fallout of this, the dangerous fallout, and Victor may agree, disagree with me, is we now have a North Korea that's on the verge of tactical nuclear, nuclear weapons, and the South Koreans are now talking about their questions about extended American deterrence and whether they should be thinking about their own nuclear weapons. Well, that's a wake-up call to Washington, and I think it says to me that we've got to get back in the, in the game of somehow engaging North Korea. Second point I would make is we did engage China. China was helpful in the six-party talks. I think we've given up on China at this point for some good reasons. But again, I think we've got to try and put this back on the agenda with the Chinese and put some onus on the Chinese that this problem in Northeast Asia is their problem. It's not our problem exclusively. They have a national security problem now because if you look down the road, Japanese nuclear weapons, South Korean nuclear weapons, where is this all going to go? And so I think we have to have a very serious uh, attempt with the Chinese to say, you're on the wrong course. Supporting North Korea is not going to work and it's just going to make a nuclear disaster zone of Northeast Asia. Bonnie and Chris, do you want to chime in on that? Uh, we could go on forever, but uh, time is short. We're near the end of our time here on stage. Um, can, can I just go say, ahead, yeah, Richard. I, what, I mean, the, um, Dennis talked about, and, and Chris talked about sort of the personal diplomacy and personal relationship that President Bush had with leaders around the world, but, but particularly in Asia. Um, I, I, think that's, I think that's very true. I actually last week saw John Howard um, in Asia, and he still talks very fondly uh, of, of President Bush and, and uh, their private lunches and dinners they, they spent together. State dinner. State dinner. Um, but I would also say that even with, uh, I think somebody mentioned difficult relationship with South Korea at the time, even with the South Korean president, President No Mui Hyun at the time, who was, you know, ideologically on the other end of the spectrum from the president, um, 
was very focused on engagement with North Korea uh, almost at any cost. Even there, even though they didn't share the same sort of Bush-Koizumi relationship, they had, a, they had a good relationship and they got a lot done. Um, again, ground troops in Iraq, uh, visa waiver, NATO plus three status, chorus free trade agreement. There were a host of things, arguably more that was accomplished in that four year period, four to five year period between those two leaders than we had seen in the history of the US-Korea relationship. So um, even though he had great relationships and that was his leadership style, even with people he didn't necessarily see eye to eye with on things like North Korean human rights or other issues, they still managed to do business and get a lot done. Great. Well, in conclusion, um, let's just do a quick lightning round if you want to offer you know, one quick takeaway from this discussion on where we go from here. Uh, Bonnie, let's start with you. I guess on, on uh, China, I, I would go back to a point that I mentioned earlier, which is I think uh, uh, what we need to think a little bit more in D.C. is how do we make sure that we aren't on a trajectory in which the Chinese perceive that we are at a collision course, right? Sort of how do we get out of this fatalism loop that we're increasingly hearing from the Chinese side? That we will, that if, if the United States keeps on the course that they see us doing, and if China keeps on continuing their very aggressive, very course of action, how do we prevent the, the collision? And here I think some of the, what, what the uh, transition memo offers us is that perhaps one thing that we should do is think more of, um, personal diplomacy, high-level diplomacy, see what President Biden can do, particularly in another uh, meeting with Xi Jinping, whether that's in the United States, at APEC, or elsewhere, but really see what we can do at that very high level where, where reading through what happened then, I see that we haven't done nearly as much in the last couple of, uh, uh, last couple of years. But also, um, we also need to think about, even if we are relatively certain right now of China's aggressive and coercive uh, tendencies, and it's likely that as China becomes more and more powerful, that China will continue on that approach, how do we build in room in our strategy that we could, uh, we could have space, that if future leaders in China do shift off of that course, that we can still engage and work with China? Thank you. Chris? Yeah, i just quickly pick up on, on Victor's point about um, sort of the seeds of multilateralism in East Asia that, that you all sort of planted and, and nurtured. I really see this as the great opportunity of the day, right? When you look around, you see the elevation of the quad to the leader level. Um, the meeting itself in Australia didn't happen, but they had a short meeting in, uh, in Hiroshima. And if you look at the joint statement that was released afterwards, this is a very substantive agenda that the quad is now driving. Uh, and that's emerged since, since um, the work that you all got started on. The U.S.-Japan-Australia relationship is remarkable. Uh, and, the, and in particular, the growing security ties between J Japan and Australia themselves. Um, it won't be long until you see self-defense force personnel training in Australia, something that would have been uh, pretty unthinkable just a few years ago. Um, and then the progress in the U.S.-Japan uh, rock relationship. Um, uh, you know, the, the agreement to begin real-time missile data threat, uh, mis missile threat data sharing um, is a significant step toward a more integrated alliance posture and, and most recently the progress with the Philippines. So what's interesting is that you really do see sort of a web forming, a mesh forming of among U.S. like-minded allies and partners and it started, I think, in a lot of the work that you all did and it's clearly matured because of uh, the common threat picture that these that that our friends uh, increasingly see with us. Excellent. Well, that's a great note to end on, uh, and an element of continuity, uh, an instinct to still explore personal diplomacy uh, and and dialogue at high levels with China, while also continuing to make our alliances and partnerships in the region uh, more dynamic. The book is Handoff. Um, it's it's a fascinating. Um, look at the challenges the Bush administration faced in Asia and around the world um, with profound implications for uh, U.S. strategy today. So please join me in thanking our distinguished panel for their comments. <laughs>